In this video, we're going to be exploring how we carry out continuity of protective conductors, including main and supplementary bonding. In the previous video, we introduced continuity testing and the fundamental principles of the test. In this video, we will be expanding on those ideas and looking at how we test in more detail, including how we test a three-phase motor and calculate our expected R1 plus R2. And this video is perfect for those individuals looking at more advanced aspects on continuity testing, or those who may be coming to the end of their electrical training and preparing for an assessment under a strict controlled environment. And if you didn't know, this video is one in a series we have done on continuity of protective conductors made in association with test instrument solutions. You can watch them individually or as a training package to help you with your CPD and receive a certificate to prove you've completed the training. So in this video, I'm gonna be supported by a very special guest, lecturer, assessor, and internal quality assessor for Lincoln College Electrical Department, Andy Bellis. Andy, thank you so much for joining me today. That's no problem, Joe. So Andy, you've supported countless learners with their electrical testing. Is continuity of protective conductors one of those that they struggle with? I'm afraid so, Joe. Continuity testing does pose problems for some, and uh, it's really essential because continuity testing underpins all other tests. In this video, we're going to be calculating R01, R2s using Guidance Note 3, but you also said about testing a DOL circuit. Yes, a lot of uh, learners really struggle to understand the working principles of DOLs. Okay. Uh, and again, this is an essential element uh, for any electrician to gasp. Brilliant. Certainly for those who may be preparing for an assessment in a controlled, strict environment. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's start with how we can calculate our expected R1 plus R2 values of an electrical circuit. You will need guidance note 3, a calculator and something to write on. So our circuit is 32 metres in length with a 4 millimetre squared line conductor and a 2.5 millimetre squared CPC. Appendix B of Guidance Note 3 outlines the resistance of copper and aluminium conductors. Table B1 shows the values of resistance per metre for our copper and aluminium conductors at 20 degrees Celsius. Values of temperature will matter a little later on. Using the table, we can see what the resistance is of cable by cross-sectional area per metre. It also shows us the combined resistance of line and the protective conductor, as well as the line conductor by itself, and the values given are in milliohms per metre. For example, if I take this 10 millimetre squared cable here, it has a resistance of 1.83 milliohms per metre. If I divide this number by a thousand, as we have a thousand milliohms to the ohm, it will give me a value of 0 0.00183 ohms. For our circuit, we can see that a 4 millimetre line conductor with a 2.5 millimetre squared protective conductor has a resistance of 12.02 milliohms per metre. We then want to multiply this by the length of our circuit, which is 32 metres. Finally, we are going to divide this by a thousand and this will turn our milliohms into an ohm. This gives us an answer of 0.38 ohms, which is our expected R1 plus R2 for our electrical circuit. Earlier, I mentioned about temperature and how these values are stated with the cable at 20 degrees Celsius. Temperature can have a significant impact on resistance. The hotter a cable, the higher the resistance. So if your cable is being installed in a location which has an ambient temperature of 30 degrees, then the resistance is going to be higher. Table B2 gives us ambient temperature multipliers for table B1. So let's say our cable is installed in an area with an ambient temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. I multiply 0 0.38 ohms, we calculated from our circuit resistance at 20 degrees, by 1.04, which increases my resistance to 0 0.4 ohms. So the higher temperature increases the resistance. In reality, this could mean that a circuit installed in an area where the ambient temperature exceeds 20 degrees. The result, when combined with another test, look out for a future video on that, may exceed the maximum permitted values for our circuit. These values are also given to you in the on-site guide in Appendix I if you don't have your guidance note to hand. I'm going to leave table B1 here for just a second and invite you to pause the video so you can use the table to have another go yourself. Perhaps this time work out the R1 plus R2 of a smaller cable to see how the cross-sectional area of a cable directly impacts resistance. Something I've seen learners struggle with 
is the correct process of carrying out a continuity of protective conductors test on a DOL three-phase circuit. So I'm going to carry out a test on this three-phase circuit here. Starting with safe isolation, we switch off the distribution board, lock off and retain the key. The reason a lot of learners and electricians get caught out by direct line starters or DOLs is through a lack of experience working on them and understanding how they work. For example, pressing this button here will not close the switch inside the unit. To do that, we need it to be live. And if you're struggling to understand motor control, then be sure to check out the CPD we did on this very subject. I've left a link in the notes below. Pushing in this part of the contactor here will close the contacts. However, doing this can damage this part of the contactor itself. Also, you may not be able to make a good enough contact, which could lead to unreliable results. So what's the best solution? Well, if you're wiring the DOL from the consumer unit, you could link the conductors through whilst you carry on with the rest of the installation and then connect them into the contactor after you've completed this test. This also helps you carry out another test which follows on from this one. Alternatively, you can remove the conductors and link them through as long as what you are using offers a very low resistance so not to give us higher readings. So with the line conductors linked out in the DOL, we can now test each individual line conductor and the leads of the MFT Pro nulled out. We can start the test. L1 is 0.1, L2 is 0.7 and L3 is 0.7. Champion! You need to record all three of these results on your schedule of test results. as because the motor circuit is three phases. It should take up three rows. Many learners have taken the highest reading and recorded it, which is not correct. So let's look at testing the bonding conductors next. This test rig has a gas and water pipe on the installation with a 10 mil cable supplying them both. Testing the bonding may seem straightforward enough as we are using test method two to obtain a result, but many learners I have assessed have got this test wrong. When testing the continuity of the bonding conductor, it is important that we disconnect the bonding cables out of the main earthing terminal. This is so we can isolate each bonding leg and also to avoid lower readings due to parallel paths. Now, although the difference on a training rig is going to be minimal, it does make a difference when we're out on site. So it's really good to embed that good practice now. You may be aware that the maximum permitted resistance for a bonding conductor is 0.05 ohms. But where does it say this? Truth is, nowhere. Guidance note three does shed some light on this. The first paragraph of page 61 says the resistance between two metal pipeworks needs to be of a suitably low reading, taking into account the length of the bonding conductor. It continues by highlighting that 15 meters of single core 6 mm squared cable and 25 meters of single core 10 mm squared cable is approximately 0.05 ohms. But because the resistances are so low, the test instruments, even top quality testers like this one here from Test Instrument Solutions, are not able to accurately read it to this low range. And because test instruments are different with differing accuracy ranges, it's generally agreed that the reading less than 0.1 ohms is acceptable for bonding conductors. We also need to test the effectiveness of a bonding clamp as shown in figure 2.16 of guidance note three. We test out the clamp first to verify continuity, then move between 0.5 to a metre away from the clamp. This is to ensure the resistance of the extraneous conductive part is certainly being low. Andy, thank you so much for helping me out today on explaining the testing of continuity of protective conductors. But have you got any final pointers that we can give our learners who may be preparing for a assessment under strict controlled conditions? Well, yes, Joe, I do. One of the most common mistakes made by our learners carrying out continuity protective conductors test is not testing at every point. Remember, if it has a CPC, we've got to be testing at every point. That's great advice. So in our next video, we're going to be going into the real world to explore some of the challenges faced by electricians when carrying out continuity of protective conductors. And don't forget that this video is one of a series of videos that has been made in association with Test Instrument Solutions. And you can complete them as part of a CPD package. This will help you with your CPD and you'll get a certificate as well.
Brilliant. So it's bye-bye for now. Bye-bye for now.